Yeah, it is. Um, hello and welcome. Welcome to um, Salamander's virtual event celebrating issue 54, um, which is my, let me see, I'm gonna look at my shelf, my fifth issue as editor. Super excited um, to, that you're all are here with us today, that we have some fabulous readers. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to having a good time. I did want to say a couple of things. The chat is open for our audience members. If while you're listening, you want to like make some comments and observations, you're welcome to do so in the chat. Um, and then I have um, activated the live transcription. So you're welcome to turn keep that on or uh, leave it off however you feel to do so. All right. And I think that's it. I don't have too many rules, I feel like. <laughs> It's, it's not the classroom, right? Uh, what I will say before I make my opening comments is just a quick um, thank you for being here, whatever you've survived up to this point, up until this evening, thank you for making time uh, to be here with us, uh, with these readers, their words, um, and just celebrating um, being alive, which is what literature does and what, what we're in the business of. Um, supporting, contributing to, and editing literary journals, and sharing our work. That's that's the the, the big thing we get to do. Uh, okay, let me get my opening notes. All right, so this is just right from the editor's note that I have for myself. So as the great compartmentalization continues, which is my phrase, um, the phrase that I have been using to refer to the constant shifting of this ongoing pandemic, of strife, of troubles, of sorrow, and continued exploitation of labor and lives here and abroad. I find myself more readily speaking of hope in my conversations with students and fellow writers. It's not a thing I intend. My black t-shirts and Doc Martens balk at the idea of sentimentality. I'm also one to bluntly balk at the concept of universality, but that's a TED talk for another day. In the writing world, hope manifests in being brought out of our solitude. Whether it's someone retweeting one of your poems and sharing how it changed their lives, to someone perking up when they hear you are a writer and having the conversation flow beyond small talk, to a sense of mutual respect and shared insight and fascination of this practice so tied to language and its mutability, writers find writers. And it is in this spirit that I welcome you to this virtual event featuring three dynamic writers, Matt Gabbert, Ahimsa Timoteo Bodran, and Julia Alicia Case. And um, they're gonna read in that order. So I wanna make sure I get that going. Uh, so Mag Gabbert will read first. She is the author of Sex, Depression, Animals, Mad Creek Books, forthcoming in 2023. So look out for that this spring. Um, it won the Charles B. Wheeler Prize and includes some of the work published here. Mag is a 92nd Street Y Discovery Award recipient and she teaches at Southern Methodist University. Uh, and without further ado, let's welcome Mag. Hi, thank you so much, Jose, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for inviting me to take part in this event. And I'm so um, pleased and honored to be reading and taking part in this alongside Julia Alicia and Ahimsa as well. Um, this is my office at SMU. So um, you can get a little feel for the office vibe. I'm going to read a few poems from my forthcoming book, and then I'll read a few poems that are from my newer work in progress, just to keep things spicy. Um, the first poem is titled America. What does it mean to be in love with Theodore Roosevelt? to lust for another man wearing loose fitted khaki, hat folded and tilted at the brim, who owns a horse unsurprisingly named Texas, talks about how much he loved shooting another man and says he doubled up neatly as a jackrabbit. And his own men said they would have gone to hell with him knowing that I have also killed a few things, insects mostly, a squirrel once with my car at 16, later a field mouse and a possum while driving across Texas 
Like Teddy, I have always eaten meat, though I can only stomach fishing. And even then, I think of the sound, thrashing, inside the red and white cooler, how it must feel. This is a group of poems that I don't typically read at events, and that, that's kind of exciting for me. Um, I'm not sure if I've ever read this poem as part of an event before. It's titled Bone. The day my fingers were folded into a swinging door's hinge and pressed there like flowers. The way my father explained his wife's cancer as if it were ice, the way his voice fractured. In college, my boyfriend's father tried to free a horse with hooves stuck in a cattle guard. Then it reared from the sparks. Each leg snapped like a matchstick and it collapsed into ashes. Why does this swarm of bees hang from a tree limb like a chest without ribs? And why do cracked ceramics, when repaired with gold lacquer, seem to glimmer between seams? Somewhere, the wings of a resting monarch close and open like eyelids. Somewhere, a fuse is being lit. Somewhere, a snake slips outside of his skin as he slips his jaw open. So I will also be reading as a part of this, um, the two poems that were published in issue 54 of Salamander. I'm so, so pleased and excited to um, finally be in this journal that I've submitted to for years. Um, the first of those two poems is called Crack and it's a uh, more, personal piece that's uh, close to my heart in many ways. Um, and it's about my, my dad's crack addiction. He was addicted until I was 26 years old. Now he works in recovery. This is the first time I've really directly written about that in a poem. Crack. One of my dad's favorite jokes starts like this. I can't believe they got back together after all that shit. Some nights, he just left, and when I tried to reach him, I'd hear the silence my head makes when I swallow my own spit. Cracked voices, codes, smiles, doors, cases, books, cans, bones, glasses, phones. Cracks taken at, slipped past, sound of a bullet, some nights I listened for tires of the slam of our screen door until morning broke in. Cracks siblings in English, a list. Rook, grackle, castle, crow. When dad rolled down the window to hold out his cigarette, the rush of cold air always scattered my breath. Like stones pre pressed in a nest of black ants. Yes, my dad smoked it. My friends wonder if I struggle to date men because I notice too many faults in them. Sometimes I imagine asking dad why he went to prison. This is parent parenthetical. Assault with a deadly weapon, assault on family by threat, emergency call interference, I imagine his side of that story. The punchline involves butt cheeks. Dad used to lay shirtless down our long hallway for weeks, yelling to me, Smelly, come help me. Smelly, I'm dying. Always this space between the person we are and the person we want to be. Derived from the Greek to split, Sanskrit, knife, Latin, void, empty, and Old Church Slavonic, scythe. 
You see, the nature of crack is to crack between the narrative. I was a kid. He always claimed he was dying. I didn't know how to help him. Step in a hole, you'll break your mother's sugar bowl. Step on a nail, put your father in jail. So just want to show you all, this poem is written with bullet points. So you may or may not have heard there are threads that are sort of woven through, um, but are interrupted by other threads. This is a short poem also from my forthcoming book from the animal section. It's called B. I go out to get tattooed. A serpent, a bear skull, it doesn't matter. I wait for the brief prick of needle to bone. Pain doesn't ask you to think about it. A steady hum like a swarm, it swells into heat gathered up from each sting. Simple and dazzling, it renders me a hollow thing, a bright and present halo. In one of the poems for my forthcoming, or not for my forthcoming book, but my work in progress, um, I kind of respond to this piece I just read when I turned it in during the time I was working on my PhD, my teacher said, I don't think it's true that pain doesn't ask you to think about it. I think that's all that pain asks you to do. And I thought that was interesting. So I wrote about that. Uh, I'm beaming into you all from Dallas, Texas. Uh, that's where I live. And in fact, I live about 50 yards from where um, JFK was assassinated. I walk past it every day with my dog. And so I thought I would read this poem uh, that considers that event titled Anniversary. There's a moment in the videotape after the president has been shot when Jackie crawls onto the trunk of the car she moves back toward the asphalt 500 yards before the reality that existed six seconds ago. She's grabbing at something, a piece of his skull or brain matter. Grief without context. We scramble for the tools to build it a container. It changes shape and color. It moves at us in waves, the car, the gun, the brain. It's settling in. It's eroding the shore we're standing on. The asphalt slips behind and behind. The present keeps arriving. I think I'm just going to read um, two more poems. These two are from my work in progress, my second manuscript in progress. Um, the first is titled, Is Love Holographic? And I was super excited to have it featured in the most recent American Poetry Review, another journal I've tried for a long time to get into. Is Love Holographic? Remember that trick where there's a dove inside a cage, then somehow the dove remains after a magician takes it away? Every letter I place here absorbs sky into the blank page. Am I trying to stare straight at the sun? Can a sheet of just paper still keep me warm? What's not a mirage but like one? Lines too long to even look broken. Moon roofs, glass bottom boats, mirrored windows, ice flows sculpted into swans. Why does everyone expect to find you in this poem? Why do I keep writing you texts? Where do I begin? Would I rather dive into a pool or the ocean? 
Is every sentence that lies a horizon? Is every word polished enough to seem clear yet or reflective? Who cares? This is not a rhetorical question. What besides light is immersive? What besides language takes risks? And for the last poem that I am going to read, um, this is also a part of my second manuscript in progress, but it's the second poem that was featured in issue 54 of Salamander as well. A poem that's really important to me. It's dedicated to one of my very best friends, another poet, Chen Chen, who, if you know anything about him, is famously in love with moons. Uh, so this, this poem is called Moons. A fathom used to mean the furthest distance a person could reach. A yawn, like chasm, chaos, or hiatus, is another name for space. Chiasma. Inside the globe of the brain, there is a dark place where two hemispheres meet. The French say that dusk falls in between two kinds of beasts, horny bodies, bodies that cannot make their own heat, the arc of a flung fist, the way a dog circles before it sits down, eyes lined with blue crescents because the phone rings and rings, an open mouth, commas, especially when they separate two or more items in a list, a boy, a beacon, a buoy. It's like I've been running all night beside myself. Thank you all so much again. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm always doing snaps. Thank you, Mag. Um, let me quickly do the thing. I will add spotlight and remove spotlight. Um, real quick, before you leave, I believe Mag has to um, go to a meeting and we feel, we feel for you. But um, I wanted to say, is the poem you shared from APR, is that the one that was on the back of the magazine? I remember you sharing that on social media. Yeah, it's on the whole like back cover of it. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. No, APR, I, I always keep sending, hasn't happened yet, but that you got in and got the back cover. Oh my, oh, that's I amazing. was totally so. like, what? Are you kidding me? And it was a <laughs> poem I had stopped sending out. I didn't think anybody would want it. So mm -hmm. just goes to show. Yeah, keep trying, keep trying. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, that's that's the spirit. It was cool to see you share that. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, American Poetry Review, they still do like newspaper print kind of a, of a, a journal, and it's kind of big like a newspaper, and they always print a poem on the back, and that always seemed like such a cool thing. So thank you, and I shared that link too. So check out Mag and have fun at your meeting. Fun, right? All right, so our next poet is Ahimsa Timoteo Bodran, and I, I just, I'll read the bio and then I want to say something. So Ahimsa Timoteo Bodran is the author of Archipiagos, Antes y Después del Bronx, Lenate Hooking, and South Bronx Breathing Lessons. He's also the editor of Yellow Medicine Review's International Queer Indigenous Issue and co-editor of Movement Research Performance Journal's Native Issue. Um, and yeah, I, I'll just be brief and say that um, I met Ahimsa through Canto Mundo a couple years back, and it was a pretty like um, important meeting, important kind of connection to make, and um, it meant a lot to, to meet you, and I'm so glad that you're able to share your words tonight. Um, and it reminds me too, I'm going to make a note that um, I believe you're in one of my poems, so I need to uh, share that with you. <laughs> at some point but it's all good it's all good I just I'm like right I brought his voice in and um, it was a pivotal moment so uh, but I'll, I'll let that be its own kind of secret thing um, <laughs> fine keep your secrets uh, without further ado please welcome the wonderful poet Ahimsa Timoteo Bodran thank you so much um, greetings can everyone hear me okay okay um Sometimes the internet connectivity is a little unstable, so I've hopefully switched to the best possible tether to my phone. Um, so uh, greetings. It is an honor to be reading from the 
Peter Bolo Foundation in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. This beautiful territory has historically been the crossroads of Haudenosaunee, larger Iroquoian, Shawnee, and additional tribal communities. I also want to acknowledge the federally and state recognized tribal nations existing within Virginia. May your sovereignty continue and flourish. North America has more salamander species than anywhere in the world, and their biodiversity is concentrated here in the Appalachian Mountains. May we work to ensure that biodiversity. I want to thank Salamander for organizing this reading and Editor-in-Chief Jose Angel Aragus for selecting the first two poems I'll be reading. Illumination. If you hold the syringe sideways, is it more gangster? You push the plunger through the barrel. The hilt of the blade hubs the needle, holds the shaft's darkness as a lumen. Beveled at an angle at the sight of insertion, the event horizon is beyond your visible range. All futures pull towards it. At the point of entry, there is no light. There is only light. And the second poem that's in the issue, it's really lovely to have both of these in the journal. Invoke an inflorescent incantation. Meditate though you balk at stalk, my tassels tantalize man-child majazzling, intricate florals radiate out from the central sunflower, butterflies dally, dance, bees prance, bumble, dizzy, bop, pop out like beads, pollen heavy through levees, yellow grains de-hiss, this bliss hiss, transfer through tongue kiss from my cheeks to yours, anthers, floral antlers, cheekbones not eye-blacked but yellowed, hello, hungry you, lip slick, diptych drunk, punk, percussive pant, rant, cant, war paint, my taint, as if my drum is something with which you are infinitely familiar. Brown. I summon spells, quash death knells, warlocks, wizards, their wands. All are powerless in this sanctuary, sperm banctuary. Lay down your wet weapons, soldier. This is the rest your quest led to. Your lips quiver. I have a steady place for your bow. The next poem I will read was published in Prism International out of Vancouver, Canada. Crosstown. Snakes turn the pages, hold your place till you return with gloves. Each marble step depressed by footfalls of those before me. Before diaspora, the people of the third book practice perfect amnesia. Generations after reconcile records of all the soulless. Those that survive not turn to the salt, acquiesce to archives of the latest saints. Before bankruptcy, black robes are laundered, never fully clean, non-idle hands arrest the night. Extinguish all light, candles, small children's wings, clipped, cloistered, collateral. Crowned colonial cartographers confiscate, conceive cages, canaric, Comorbid, choirs concord the canon, concoct chimera. Cardinals contest contagion, charlatan charismata counter complicity. Crosstown, corona counts coup, collects coffins, coughs up blood. Um, the last piece I'll read is an essay published in the Queer and Trans Voices issue of MISNA, Prose, Poetry, and Art Exploring Arab America. I'm deeply grateful to the guest editor, Zane Jokalar, as well as executive and artistic director, Lana Salah Barkawi, and the editorial team for the support in helping shepherd this piece into existence. The deeply evidenced loving care editors of color put into this world needs to be acknowledged. I hope this piece helps people reflect upon what is at stake in the upcoming midterm elections and that we mobilize all eligible voters to register, check their voter registrations. I was just reading today about all the attempts at purging like tens of thousands of voters. I think over attempt to like purge over 60,000 voters in Georgia alone. Um, and that we mobilize all folk to register, check their voter registration, if need be re-register, including all those who have recently turned 18, gained citizenship, transitioned, moved or changed names. Um, and this is a bipartisan, just get out the vote kind of message. 
We need to mobilize around the US Senate, House of Representatives, governors, secretaries of state, mayoral, and additional down ballot races. Now this might get a little more partisan, even though I don't claim a particular side. The arts, education, the environment, our libraries, multiply oppressed communities, reproductive freedom, our health systems, civil and human rights, tribal sovereignty, and democracy itself are all at stake. And I'm not just thinking about the group we're gathered today, but hopefully this recording will go out into the world. Um, please do your part to get out the vote. Thank you. So I'm gonna take a sip of water and then read this last piece. <clears throat> How to make white supremacy generative, how to survive a pandemic. You will be made to think of yourself as hazardous, toxic, waste. You will be afraid of touching others, told you should not touch others, touch yourself. You will be seen as a predator, marked as contagion, your body, a weapon, your intimacy, suspect. You will be told you do not understand viruses, how health systems work, you know nothing, are too political, not enough. You are ignoring other issues, are another issue, special one. Wait, this is not your time. You are not pivoting fast enough. You should already be creating, organizing, innovating ways to be digitally consumed online. Monetize this moment, make it work for you like 9-11. Make genocide generative. You are not topical, irrelevant to the moment you will be forgotten, seize it. You are too far from the source of the center. Outside quarantine zones, your narrative does not matter. Even though your family is ill, your home, you were just there. You cannot stop reading, refresh, calling, donate, emailing, do whatever you can, stop this. You wonder if you shouldn't have left. Not leaving is always on your mind, as are your dead, which you could be multiplying. You are not deserving of any test you will fail anyway. This is the language of the virus. Wait three days before reading this. Three days after reading this, you can touch someone again, touch your face again. Every self-loving fluid your body produces something they want to seal off, encase, and lace. Self-contained you must be. Show no cracks in your veneers. Be polite, white, perfect. Put a doily on it. Not be a troublemaker. You do not want the police military called. If they are called, you must kneel and act a performance of perfect citizenship, even if you are not a citizen, even if they are far from perfect. This is how you perfect the pandemic. This is how you make it pay, how you are made to pray. Give thanks for being here. Cross yourself. You take notes and send it to another antibody. Our notes of this will be erased. Confiscated and conscripted, we must make an archive against the reordered records of the hate state. Dig in against the dearth of data. If our archives are housed in multiple locations, it is more difficult to erase us from the official narrative. Too many libraries to burn, files to delete. Back up, back up, keep your hands visible, redistribute. Wipe away tear gas, milk in your pepper sprayed eyes. Batons and rubber bullets bounce off skulls once intact in a time of hatreds. Record this memory of us not touching, our lips unlocked, hands untwined, letters braid with mind and brine. Preserved in salt, we are ancient pathogens, generations of pathology passed down upon us. Let us unscroll our holy helixes, so many stories in so many pairs, un and refolding, we combine. Some new matrix of meaning, we melange, bedrock method, this methane for later release. Local species will be replaced, we seep up through the cracks. Bodies are stacked one upon another, sometimes share a bag. Our liquids and gases exceed their containers. One, two thousands amass a grave. Drones deliver not births, screenshot hulls of hills, hollowed, heartless islands. Conservative circle jerk contagion, gussy up a genocide, genuflect in retrospect, gaslight their sound bites. Cold trucks not filled with ice cream, toll trolls, underbridge, maskless summer, not for we. Patriotism proselytizes punches, pulled back triggers, such acceptable losses, unfriendliest of fires. 
inconsequential as long as male sorting machines can be repurposed to sort bodies, shred ballots. We will be blamed for colonial comorbidities, uncounted in a census ended early, only whites worthy of enumeration. Perhaps a property requirement can be reinstated. Upon this graveyard, perhaps a man speak, make decisions for his household, suffrage be revoked. Endless dreams of delusional despots, deplorables goose step, duck, duck, dictator, predators flash grenades, pundits stroke sound cannons, a square is cleared, a book bunkered, undone. Shut up, the voice telling you is not your own. If you were more dead, you would feel less guilty. Only dead should hold pencils, type phantom keys. The weight of all things not written upon your chest sits, each unspoken subject indexed, unscribed mark erased, makes it more difficult to breathe, finish a sentence. You do not have time to catalog an accurate inventory of assaults. Fragment and run on all moments shrapnel enter this one. You cannot stop writing about everything else. Feel, be feel bad for not writing when you do. Weight of the interwoven constricts your rib cage. Each splintering breath, excise glock stops your glottal. More directly, obliquely, you should not write about things at all. Work trash, make a fire from it. Child of lung cancer loss, winter of whooping cough, bronchitis, pneumonia, caved ribs. You will be suspicious of each symptom, scared to share you might have symptoms, don't want to lose your job, end up homeless again. You'll be scared to cough in rooms all by yourself for fear others will hear you through the walls. You become suspicious of your own body and others. You listen as walls murmur. As if not testing could protect you from dying, harming others, you, legion, legion, have been here before. Even though we are leaders of most movements, as queer trans people of color, we are often last to be considered worthy of speaking on something. We are footnotes to ancillary text, last minute added essay, extra credit critique. What would it mean if we were recognized as the first speaking on something? Perhaps we could save lives. Perhaps the lives we could save could be our own. You are not the only one to be creating a first will and testament. You will be counting bodies in a time of counting bodies. The US never knows what to do with its bodies, with brown bodies. This is not the first time straight white Christian men have thought their lives are worth more than others, have the right to infect others with disease, spit upon us as if sidewalk, unfold this blanket, confirm the hypothesis of our experiment. You are a controlled group, expendable, only once we are dead will the full freedom be exercised, excised, exorcised. The choosing of bodies to live begins before the choice of where the ventilators and masks and gloves and bleach wipes go and don't go. It's where these hospitals were on the land centuries prior, who was allowed to enter them, who never returned, who still die on land that is and is not ours. We are choosing bodies to live. We breathe in the ashes of our dead. One day we will tell you the rest of the cremaining story. This was once a grave. Bodies were buried here. Before this became a graveyard, children danced, lovers necked, elders walked with care. This land has seen so many alterations, fill-ins, and drainages of swamp. Underground rivers still flow, salt still washes up on shore. Our dead keeps on gathering above and below the soil. Digital copies, sorry, digital copies will be disseminated to avoid cross-contamination. There are different strains. There is a strain in speaking about this. I will tape the smiling picture on my chest. You know you can be safe with me. Let me adjust your mask. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I am. I am blown away. Thank you so much, Ahimsa. That was that was amazing. I'm just gonna say it. I'm like, <laughs> uh, I'm not surprised. I'm just honoring and acknowledging. Thank you so much. 
um, let's see, I found a, a link with six more poems from Ahimsa. So you want to spend some more time with Ahimsa's work, there, there it be at the Galway Review. Uh, thank you so much for reading that. Such an important, so many important things to kind of like touch on. And um, anyway, just uh, thank you. Just thank you. Um, yeah, you got some love in the chat too. That's awesome. All right, so to wrap us up on this uh, evening, we have Julia Alicia Case. Um, and I purposefully chose this, to kind of ordered it this way because your piece uh, that you'll be reading from Julia Alicia is, um, one, it's amazing, um, just flat out. I geeked out about it when it when it came through. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, like the imagination behind this and everything. But also I feel like, especially where we're like, it was published in the summer what is it spring summer issue but we're like right now heading into fall so I'm like ooh, let's get in that forest warm let's get a let's let's go into the dark there so um let me quickly oh thank you thank you Ahimsa uh, quickly get the proper bio so Julia Alicia Case's work has appeared in Gettysburg Review, Crazy Forest, Willow Springs, Blackbird, The Writer's Chronicle, and other journals. She earned her PhD in fiction from the University of Cincinnati, and she teaches creative writing and digital literature at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. And I remember um, when you were at the University of Cincinnati, I think I was on my way out, you were on your way in, but like, I love how the, the writing world has um, so many connections. So uh, without further ado, here is Julia Alicia Case. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Jose, for running and organizing this event. I also want to thank both of you and everyone at Salamander for your help with this story. You all gave me some great edits that I really appreciate. I'm reading from my office on campus, and it is unfortunately right across the hall from the piano lab. So it was quiet for like an hour, but someone has just come in and started playing the piano. So hopefully that will just be an added backdrop to my story. So I'm going to read the beginning of um, my story from the issue. It's called The Storming of Forest Swarm. He called it the new house, but it was very old. The landlord wouldn't say exactly. He'd said it was built in 1920 or 1900 or once the late 1800s. William wasn't sure if he was being cagey or if he really didn't know. The floors and the walls all slanted to the center and the basement stairs bucked and rocked. The house had no right angles and William thought as the landlord stood in the kitchen and insisted the hulking tilting refrigerator was indeed operational that it would never be possible for someone in the house to be completely straight with him. Across the street, giant houses reclined among sweeping lawns and stone planters, garages filled with expensive cars. Beyond them lay the city, William sometimes caught a glimpse of it. If the leaves rustled in a particular pattern, he saw skyscrapers down in the valley, the river with its solid bridges and yellow lights. Since his marriage had dissolved, he was often baffled by the things he found himself saying to strangers. Completely rusted through, he'd say to the pharmacist, compelled for some reason to tell her about packing up the old barbecue grill, laughing as if broken things were hilarious, particularly broken things that could not be fixed. You're grieving, his sister Sarah told him, just let it happen but he found himself in the midst of so many awkward conversations at work that he could barely keep up with his A15 forms. At night, he tried to catch up, sat at his crooked desk and typed numbers into squat boxes. Occasionally the wind blew and the city lights clustered like a distant galaxy he would never again visit. Behind his house lay a strip of forest and behind the forest were other crooked houses, other buckling driveways and rusted cars, tilting porches and broken windows. The houses were similar to his own, with disintegrating roofs and stained siding. We're gentrifying, the landlord said. It's not just a rumor. He nodded in the direction of the forest. Don't worry, it's all on its way out. When the A15 forms got too boring, which was often, he'd go online to a chat site where they paired people anonymously with random strangers. I've always thought of myself as middle class, he typed to anonymous one who had described herself as SWF28, but here I am in this house and it's like a club membership I'm supposed to be proud of. He gave up on the A15 forms and saved them. In the old neighborhood, we were never thinking about who should and shouldn't be there. Want to see my slideshow, anonymous one wrote, bunch of nude pics. Outside the leaves shifted and he caught a glimpse of the stadium. There was a game going and the lights were on. Sure, he wrote, why not? He looked at the place on his desk where he'd once kept pictures. He had photos of the girls in a box somewhere. He should unpack them before they came over. 
I just don't understand, he wrote, all this glee in driving people out. Anonymous One had uploaded a file. My slideshow, it was called. William clicked it. What do you think, Anonymous One wrote? Should I be a model? It's still loading, he wrote. A box popped up. Are you sure you want to continue? William clicked yes and watched the progress bar. Have you ever been wrecked like this? He asked Anonymous One. It's like my insides have been stolen. My heart's not broken. It's just gone. He hit agree on the screen, but I'm an emblem of progress. By existing in this spot, I am improving the city. The file opened, but it was just a document. The 10 rules of Forest Swarm, it said. His web browser opened forestswarmisreal.net. I think you sent the wrong file, he typed. The web page was only a photo. In it, a forest of tree people looked out at him. Their bodies were gnarled trunks and scabbed bark, and they had narrow dark eyes blacker than the river. Their hair churned with vines and branches. They glared and snarled, their mouths full of splintery teeth. We're coming for you, the caption said. SWF my ass, William wrote, but Anonymous One had gone offline. He talked his sister into driving him by the other new house. He'd moved to the hill, and he didn't know where they had moved, but he imagined something down in the valley with a creek and a series of bridges. His wife had given Sarah the address, which she thought was a way of giving it to him, too. So the idea is what, he asked Sarah. They want to relocate lower-income people, but they're not overlords. They can't just drive people out of their homes. So what is the plan? Increased rents? Vigorous homeowner associations? You're not getting out of the car, Sarah said. We're driving by slowly and the seatbelt is staying fastened. It's bullying, he said. It's the rich kids in the 80s movies, but good things never happen to those kids. The movie is never their story, you know? This is a stage in the process, Sarah said. You see that she's moved on and you can move on too. You are not under any circumstances to come back here. The neighborhood was packed with homes that were all alike and that they were minimally different from one another. He recognized Hannah's bike with the Latigre stickers plastered across the frame. She'd left it leaning against the basketball hoop, which was very, very straight. Those tires look low, he said. I hope she's not riding that to school. Your job, Sarah said, is to stay in the car. She nodded out the window. Look, there's the lilac bush she moved from the old house. And also their names are on the mailbox. The front walkway was all flagstones, perfectly flat and even. It's a strange world, he said, where buying a house is making a statement. He'd been talking for a few minutes, he realized. What did he said? What did he say when he wasn't paying attention? How are you? He asked Sarah. How have things been in your life? Sarah shook her head and put the car in drive. At his house, dead leaves clogged the porch, a whole pile of dead leaves heaped in front of the door. It's like that place in the ocean, he said, where all the trash collects in a huge whirlpool. Sarah had driven away. He was speaking to no one. When he opened the door, leaves furled around his feet. He stomped them into tiny particles on the carpet. In his office, a green light shone from his computer, bright and eerie. Had his computer always had that light? Like a cat, he said, going off and doing things without you. A tree toppled over in the night, slamming into the backyard, crumpling the chain link fence and throwing bark fragments across the lawn. Sinister, he said as he, was waiting, as he waited for the landlord to answer the phone. The girls were coming for dinner and he wanted to cook something, something from their childhood. Well, my kids love grilled cheese, the landlord said. Why did you call me? It's an old tree, William said, shattered everywhere, probably completely hollow. Now that he was paying attention, there were a lot of dead trees in the forest, tall ones with massive branches. This tree had fallen in the yard, but another could easily smash into the house. Why were all the trees so dead anyway? Is forest even the right word for it, the landlord wondered. William thought of the disintegrating houses on the other side of the forest. Only the idealistic or the desperate would live so close to tall dead trees. They're planning to reclaim the land, build condos, the landlord said. Luxury is coming, it's only a matter of time. Approaching like a lava flow, William thought, in that city where everyone was mummified. Pompeii, the landlord said, and I'm not sure mummified is how I'd describe it. I'll send some guys to deal with the tree. William went shopping for things the girls would eat. Alphabet cereal, juice boxes, cheese and cracker kits with spongy lunch meat. I'm sorry, the cashier said. She was responding to something he told her, words he'd spoken without meaning to. Divorce is never easy, I'm still processing my own. William considered her knobby knuckles and thin fingers, saw how her gold rings slid and twisted. Would his hands look like that one day? He jammed them in his pockets. Sarah and the girls arrived with chicken wings and french fries. We brought dinner, Sarah said, setting the bags on the table. Do you have napkins? Hannah looked at the pot of tomato soup warming on the stove. Did you forget we were coming, she said. Now that he considered it, definitely wasn't enough soup for all of them. 
Celia surrounded her plate with small plastic animals. The echidnas are hungry, she said when he came to hug her. Liam wasn't sure what an echidna was. Are they the ones who are scared of the dinosaurs? It's a family of plastic animals, Hannah said. They all love each other. Do you not have ketchup? She hung on the refrigerator door, even as the refrigerator rattled and shook. No napkins either, Sarah said, ripping paper towels. This is your dad in his natural state. They laughed like it was a joke they were used to making. Sarah had gotten him the buffalo flavor. It made the paper cuts on his fingers burn. What's there to do here, Hannah asked as he cleared the dishes. We could check on the tree, he said. He saw she didn't want to, but she followed him into the backyard, pulled out her phone when Sarah couldn't see her. A thick mass of bracelets knotted both her wrists. You make those yourself, he asked. They're friendship bracelets, she said, as if that explained it. He stuck his toe into one of the chasms the branches had punched in the lawn. It was the black hole, sinister, bottomless. If he were lying in bed when a tree smashed through the roof, the branches would make similar holes in his body. I'd be stuck to the mattress, he heard himself say, impaled like a butterfly on a pin. But Hannah had gone inside. When he went back in the house, he heard Hannah talking. Cool, she was saying, and he felt his heart lift. There was something here she liked. Hannah and Celia stood by his computer, their blonde hair glowing green. Did you know your house is haunted, Hannah said. This is the best thing ever. Celia didn't look so sure. She chewed a plastic anteater. William hadn't worked that day, but three A15 forms were open on the screen. No one touched the keyboard, but numbers appeared in column 14B. The green light from the webcam glowed and the mouse darted across the screen. They watched the form complete itself, numbers appearing crisp and formal in the empty boxes, numbers like jokes, 666, 42, 69. Sarah took the girls home at nine. He'd hoped they would stay the night. He didn't have beds yet, but he'd inherited the blankets and a whole stack of pillows. He'd imagined them all building a fort, cuddling together on the carpet. Then they'd arrived and he'd realized how big they were. The carpet fort would never work. I should tell you, Sarah said after she sent the kids out to the van, Hannah has a new boyfriend. His name is Jeremiah. Sarah grinned like she was teasing him. I thought maybe you'd notice yourself, would ask who she's texting all evening under the table. But you're distracted. Sarah touched his shoulder. It's okay. Just make sure you talk to her about it. Do the dad thing, you know? Hannah had been texting under the table? It's suspicious, he said to the divot on the couch where Sarah had been. They're not training them to use technology. They're just training them to be sneaky. What had Sarah meant by new boyfriend? Did that imply there'd been an old one? In his office, the computer was still filling out its own A15 forms. They were all worthless, full of values that made no sense. 777s when the choices were one or zero. The calculation programs would throw a fit, but it was still satisfying to see the forms, a full day's work completed while he took out the trash. He changed a 777 to a zero. The computer cleared the field and typed a 666. He erased it again, tried a one this time. Sixes filled the field. The value was completely invalid, laughable even, because the box wasn't wide enough to show more than one number. That's fine, he told the green light. You fill them out however you want. The computer opened another copy of the form, began to fill the boxes with letters, which was just ridiculous, made no sense at all. The letters were all uppercase, and they made words. Forest swarm, the form proclaimed. Forest swarm will swarm your soul. Loves crunched under the wheels of his desk chair as he opened the web browser and typed forest swarm into the search box. He waited for the computer to delete or change, but the mouse slid itself over and clicked search. He barely glimpsed the results before the computer began clicking things, opening windows, pulling up images, pressing play on a bunch of different videos. The speakers crackled with soundtracks and people all going at once. A man laughed, a woman moaned. He heard a hollow sound, like the wind blowing around something dying. He tried to mute, but the volume just got louder. Hey, he told the green light. Hey, I need to be able to read these here. The computer let him pause all the videos. It let him click through the images, but they didn't make sense. In one photo, two boys played video games on a paisley couch. In another, a naked woman lay on a table while a man in a donkey mask buried his head between her legs. In another, an older cat couple sat eating lasagna while a cat looked up at them. In one video, a man showed a fish he'd caught. In another, a woman harvested sweet potatoes. In another, a girl not much older than Hannah began to take her clothes off. She rubbed her breasts, reached between her legs. He closed out of the window. I'm a dad, he told the computer. Don't show me that stuff. Immediately, a window popped up with a naked man shown from behind, another man pumping his fist in and out. Fine, William said, whatever. He hid the window behind several others and clicked through the web pages. 
Most were forums guarded by I accept the risks statements. The computer clicked agree before he could read them. Then he was looking at a board called Forest Swarm. Those kids that shot that boy on the railroad tracks, the user called Pig Venus wrote, they claimed the forest made them do it. That woman assaulted in the Safeway walk-in. She said it was trees, the muffin wrote, not one tree, but hundreds, a whole forest. She had splinters that could not be explained. There were images, hundreds, people sleeping while tree shapes lurked in the shadows, a woman washing dishes while a vine crept through a window, a dead cat surrounded by bloody sticks. Had the internet always been like this? He'd visited Pornhub a few times, but this was like wandering into a swamp, being mesmerized by strange creatures which also probably wanted to kill him. He looked back at the photos. The boys played video games, but branch-shaped shadows filled the doorway. Green eyes glowed in the back of the room. Behind the plastic ears of the donkey mask, a weathered tree stood at the window, its mouth gaping with sinister teeth. In the lasagna image, vines crept under the table, furling around legs and shoes, slithering toward the cat whose tail was slightly puffed. Here's my collection of forest swarm photos, Dank Purple had written. This is some freaky shit. William clicked the link and was taken to more images, all seemingly normal at first. Birthday parties, prom photos, family portraits. In the background, something was always wrong. Branches and vines, toothy tree-like creatures, knotty limbs creeping through windows. An urban legend, Beefy Taco wrote, a bunch of photoshopping. Maybe, Dank Purple replied, but there are so many. William turned off the computer, which immediately turned itself on again. Then he wrapped himself in a blanket that smelled like the old house and slept on the couch that had once stood in the rec room. If a tree came through the roof, it would have to fall a long way to impale him. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, it was fun realizing, oh, okay, Kate, all right, our, manager, our managing editor, Katie Sticka, has dropped in the chat um, the link so you can read the rest of the story. to Alicia, you that's quite the cliffhanger. <laughs> like you're, you're missing that ending, right? Um, no, what I love about the story is just the um, the the tension that builds within the character. That, like the, as uh, I was, was said in the chat, the big dad energy, the desperate dad energy. <laughs> and then um, um, how it's shaped by, all, you know, this world we live in, you know? So thank you so much for sharing that. And um, just that imagination. I went ahead and reshared uh, Julia Alicia's uh, website link there. Um, yeah, there, there's some funniness in there too. I agree. I agree. Um, no, and thank you so much, everyone, for being here. That concludes our evening. I should probably take the um, heat off uh, Julia Alicia. Sorry. I'm like, there we go. Replace. And we didn't hear any pianos. I'm a little. Um, I'm a little bummed, but I, I will pretend pianos happen. Uh, no, thank you all for being here, for taking the time. Thank you to our readers. It means so much to spend this time with you. Um, last thing I'll say is just simply uh, our reading period opens up again on October 1st. So um, if any of you are writers, you're welcome to um, send us some work. We'd love to read it. Um, that I, I feel like a literary journal is nothing without its uh, writers who submit and um, great community. So thank you so much. Uh, but yeah, that concludes our evening. Thank you so much. Have a good after, good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Good night, depending on your time zone. It's night over here. As you can see, it got darker over here. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Bye, Katie. Take care. I'm going to stop recording.